everyone, and welcome to what will be an exciting and timely discussion about artificial intelligence, AI, and great power competition with my esteemed colleagues, Mr. Igor Yablokov and Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vinman. My name is Jennifer Atala, and I am honored to be here with you to facilitate this discussion. I am the founder of Inata Strategies LLC, which in large part helps public, private, and nonprofit institutions build tech innovation ecosystems around the world. I am also a Truman National Security Project Fellow and North Carolina Chapter Director. It is in this capacity this that I am privileged to know and work with Mr. Yablokov. Igor Yablokov is not only a Truman National Security Project and Eisenhower Fellow, but he is also the founder and CEO of Prion, an enterprise AI company. After an early career at IBM, he previously founded AI pioneer Yap, which was Amazon's first acquisition to create Alexa. Lieutenant Colonel Vinman is likely familiar to you following his testimony in late 2019 to US Congress on the Trump Ukraine issue. He was the recipient of numerous commendations and awards, including the Purple Heart, prior to his retirement. Mr. Vinman also has a Truman connection, having been featured in last year's annual national security conference as one of our keynote speakers. He was formerly director for European affairs at the National Security Council, is a Pritzker military fellow and lawfare institute at the Lawfare Institute and a doctoral student at my alum, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He is also the author of the forthcoming book, Here Right Matters. Gentlemen, it's great to see you again, welcome. Thank you. Artificial intelligence requires massive data sets, complex algorithms, cutting edge microchips, and human artistry in design. Currently, only the wealthiest states and companies are capable of AI innovation to scale. Gentlemen, can you briefly introduce AI to our audience and share the broader implications of this technology? Sure, in some ways it's a min misnomer uh, because um... Uh, many of us as practitioners would have not called uh, called it artificial intelligence because the thing that people expect um, um, in in uh, while they consume science fiction isn't going to be uh, with us for for a long while. Uh, and so consider it smarter software that essentially automates the things that we do well uh, as humans, like vision systems, uh, speech recognition systems, and the like. Um, but what this software can do is is accomplish these tasks at scale. Uh, and so that's that's where people start, you know, thinking about how is that going to affect workforces? How is it going to affect our personal lives? How is it going to affect us at a national and international scale? Sure. And as a national security professional, I tend to look at um, AI primarily from its disruptive um, from its disruptive nature as a disruptive force. What is it mm -hmm. that it might do to the United States from a, a security perspective in terms of disrupting workforces? Uh, the effects, unforeseen effects of emerging technology like social media as it rolled out, uh, there were unforeseen consequences with regards to disinformation. And then also how our adversaries will uh, employ AI specifically uh, for, for our principal adversaries to enhance their control over their own domestic populations and influence foreign, uh, foreign populations. Thank you both for that um, great introduction. Can you maybe speak to some of the positives of, of AI and how AI can support economies and countries at the macro level, as well as what some of the negatives potentially are that we should be looking out for? Yeah, that's a rabbit hole. Uh, that's certainly a <laughs> rabbit hole. Look, I'll, you know, vis-a-vis -vis some of the positives, you know, when we were working uh, with these technologies in the IBM labs, I mean, we actually, you know, you know, had big hearts to start um, uh, um, working on these technologies for accessibility reasons, right? If you're uh, blind, guess what? You want to listen to the world uh, around you, and these types of technologies help. If you're if if, um, if you're uh, blind, I mean, it's you get an acoustic um, uh, environment in order to navigate uh, the world, and and vice versa, right? That you're able uh, to see more of the world. Um, are, are around you and get 
the, the things that people say transcribed to you so that you can read what they're saying. And so it really started with those origins uh, in, in many ways to bring those type of technologies. And then people started saying, well, wait, if you can do machine translation and speech recognition, then you can start doing other things like recommending uh, content to people so that uh, they actually stay engaged with your brands longer. Well, when you started following uh, following that rabbit hole, it's easy to to figure out why uh, some people uh, ended up putting uh, horns and uh, and uh, and hitting gavels at the Capitol. Well, it's interesting from a national security perspective uh, and a foreign policy perspective. There are lots of different applications. Uh, you could imagine a very capable uh, language learning function in which it, uh, you're able to interact with uh, with foreign counterparts as a diplomat. Uh, for soldiers on the battlefield, uh, being able to use those uh, language translation uh, functions in in the nick of time to avoid um, either enable an operation or avoid a catastrophe. Uh, you know, just, I, I imagine soldiers at a checkpoint trying to avoid some sort of escalation and having that uh, on hand language capability. So those are those are just a couple of examples from a national security perspective. I think there's also a very reasonable view of being able to use these uh, these deep learning functions to scour media and cut out some of the functions that uh, per personnel have to do the intensive uh, types of functions like looking at all the media from a particular country to understand what's going on when you could have the ai do the same kind of uh, uh same same kind of activity in a split second those are the positive ones. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into the negative ones, but uh, you know there are a lot of positive applications for AI in terms of productivity and efficiency. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking in terms of you know at the macroeconomic level, thinking about increased productivity and GDP growth, and how that balances in especially um, developed countries with uh, who will be harder hit. Um, and I think with that. Let's move to talking about some of those, those big key players. Um, ultimately, like any technology, innovation in AI is driven by the values of its creators. Chinese President Xi Jinping has declared that within the decade, China will lead the world in AI. We have seen Chinese and Russian strength, particularly in their ability to harness massive amounts of data and apply that data to existing AI technology for use cases that oftentimes go against Western democratic principles. Can you share with us your perspectives on Russia and China's perceived or actual leadership in AI vis-a-vis -vis our own in the US? Do you, Igor, if yeah, you don't mind, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. I was, I'll start with the security uh, implications. I think it's interesting that you started with the, this phrase of, uh, it's, it's the creator, uh, it's the implementer that really controls the nature of the technology. And we have a very different view of how technology should be used. Uh, Igor pointed out the fact that we see it as, as enhancing the, um, the quality of life for individuals. Our adversaries don't necessarily see it the same way. Uh, they see that uh, as a secondary or tertiary benefit. For them, it's a means to enhance control. So, for instance, one of the biggest challenges we have is the proliferation of a Chinese AI-enabled technology for surveillance, where they're taking a look at um, minority populations, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, to control uh, their movement, identify that particular ethnic group, uh, so they could be, uh, well, frankly, you know, in the worst case scenario, uh, arrested and interred. And uh, they're also using the same kinds of techniques to identify uh, foreign diplomats, uh, in their mind, potentially foreign agents, or intel agents, and be, be able to track their movements. So these are completely different views on you know what what a technology, what the implications of a technology are. And from my perspective, I think we have uh, an obligation as the leading democracy, uh, the longest living democracy, to advocate for a democratic form of artificial intelligence while our adversaries will look to exploit and uh, develop an undemocratic form of artificial intelligence. And meanwhile, in our use, right, people are using that same camera technology to try to control traffic lights so that when they see a large uh, tractor trailer driving behind uh, a family car, they actually use that computer vision to leave the green light longer because otherwise the families tend to stop 
And if there's a large um, uh, vehicle behind them, uh, that drives a lot of accidents in those intersections. So, so look, um, uh, practitioners that create artificial intelligence are creating a hammer, right? And you give this hammer to a serial killer and they're gonna be bonking people over the heads with it. Uh, give it to Jimmy Carter's uh, hands and he's gonna be building you Habitat for Humanity with the very same uh, tool. So these these are literally uh, uh, you know dual use applications for these style of technologies. Now are they ahead? Sure, maybe in terms of uh, being able to efficiently access these large uh, data sets. But look, Bezos says that AI is still first pitch, first ending. If that's true, then uh, there's a lot of creativity that's uh, that's still undiscovered, and and that naturally gravitates towards the advantages that we have as a melting pot. Maybe just riffing off a little bit off of um, Igor here. The it's the, I, I keep coming back to this idea of a disruptive technology, something that frankly could um, reimagine the world we live in in a, in a completely different direction. The way the information age uh, and social media technology has uh, has influenced populations and and uh, life, and these these technologies as they emerge in the in the U.S in the West, they tend to emerge organically. They tend to emerge from you know, a, a place of innovation, market-driven forces that allow technology to proliferate where uh, it both enhances quality of life and also, of course, uh, benefits uh, you know, the, the capitalist venture that's undertaking it. And our adversaries don't do that. Our adversaries use a lot of the, uh, financial resources, state-driven uh, to for ul ulterior motives. And I think because of these th these things are so transformative, uh, we should look at them the way we have at other transformative technologies. And this, on the face of it, might seem like an extreme scenario, but there was a public-private partnership with regards to the emergence of nuclear technology, because it was transformative, and the cost, uh, the consequences of mismanagement were so high. We should be thinking about these disruptive t technologies in much the same way. What are the potential uh, benefits, but also what are the consequences? So we don't overlook the, the harmful effects of social media and uh, the way it rolled out and uh, the, the ability to leverage disinformation to uh, you know, take the most extreme elements of society and, and pull them together. And we should advocate for some sort of ethical parameter uh, to, to be able to guide these types of technologies. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the connection between leveraging massive amounts of data to flooding social media with disinformation um, is a really interesting one. Um, and I'm, it's something that is occurring here in the US as well as um, by other states looking to influence what's happening here in the US, um, as well as in their own countries um, for micro-targeting, right? So harvesting data for micro-targeting um, in order to fragment populations and increase civil unrest, um, which we've seen in Russia, which we've seen here. I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the current trends that we're seeing um, and, and talk about how some of these language models can be used positively. Um, Igor, maybe you can tell us a little bit about OpenAI GPT-3. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. So uh, it basically hoovered um, the things that people already uh, created. Right, so that that essentially got computed into this uh, massive uh, language uh, model. I believe it was it had 175 billion parameters, but already uh, Google is showing a language model that has an order of magnitude greater parameters uh, baked uh, into it as well. The problem is it's baking all the good and all the bad of humanity into this language model as well. So. Uh, biases, racism, sexism, all are in there. And I know uh, there was a famed uh, Google researcher uh, that was essentially uh, uh, drafting a paper on on the dangers of, of essentially you, you know, pulling all of this information into this thing. Um, now, people look at something like that and call it highly sophisticated, but remember, it's just regurgitating things that humans already created. And so, you know, from that standpoint, I'm not I'm not too worried about it displacing human creativity. From that standpoint, it's a glorified uh, autocomplete, but it makes lots of things possible. For instance, in certain Reddit forums and uh, forums and what have you, uh, people already created bots in order to generate um, a synthetic data in there, and it took a while for people to figure out that it was uh, actually a bot creating these things, and it wasn't human originated. 
So while it's still relatively early for those form of technologies where you can still get a sense and fingerprint of these technologies at use, they're gonna become sophisticated enough where you will literally have deep fakes, um, textual representations of deep fakes where you won't even know if, um, if uh, somebody is real or not real, you know, throughout social media or, or any other endeavor. Um, I know that the new Turing e experiment, right, in the past, it's like, can you build a computer that can fool um, um, a, a human that it's, it's acting human-like? I think the new Turing test is going to be, uh, can you create um, uh, an AI that essentially can do its own independent research and publish a paper and then defend uh, the thesis? That's where this stuff is going, and uh, and 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 at the scale that it's going to be able to accomplish that, um, there's going to be lots of innovation, but there's going to be lots of uh, risk as well. Yeah, and I'd like to pick up on uh, two topics that that we just discussed: uh, deep fakes and uh, micro targeting. So uh, there there have been a couple of articles written on uh, basically effective targeting. And this isn't just foreign actors, domestic political actors also do the same thing. But the micro, effective micro-targeting of, of, for instance, uh, the black population in southern Florida to suppress their vote. Uh, that's, uh, if that was conducted effectively both in 2016 and seemingly, although the reports are still coming in, in, in 2020, where you had an AI function that was scouring uh, particular uh, social media, and then providing the kind of messaging that would potentially de uh, deter a, a voter from going out to vote. And in the kinds of numbers that, uh, you know, were determin deterministic in Florida, it doesn't take a lot. I mean, the margin was 300,000 votes, which, which is significant, but in a, in a uh, electorate that's millions, that's, that's relatively negligible. That's, uh, you know, half a percent or something of that nature. So that, that, uh, uh, can be twisted and applied by our adversaries also. And for me, uh, what concerns me is, you know, deep fakes, micro-targeting, when you have a uh, protest that has the potential to turn violent like we experienced in uh, January of 2021, uh, with the right kind of micro-targeting, the, with the right kind of uh, deep fakes, you could really incite a crowd to violence. And that could be used, yeah. um, here domestically in the United States, it could be used in other hotspots around the world, and uh, it could really turn into a flashpoint, especially between great powers where the risk of uh, miscalculation and accident is high, but the consequence and the escalation spiral could be potentially catastrophic. So uh, mm -hmm. these are things that we, we are not particularly uh, effective or, or well-equipped to, to handle just yet. Well, I'm curious, you know, hearing you talk about that, as well as your previous comment about the need for public-private partnership, I'm curious about what competitive advantage do you think that we can have in the U.S. Um, rooted in values-based AI, and and what role the U.S. government should play as we sort of balance innovation, creativity, um, the technical qualifications, and civil liberties. Yeah, so I think maybe the, the right place to start on this are with, with kind of the, the basic um, Western liberal value set, which is uh, protection of individual light, uh, rights and liberties, uh, pr um, the protection of uh, data and um, personal information. Uh, the, so that in, in certain regards, the, the data is owned by the individual instead of a, by a government. Uh, here, we don't quite quite have it just right, and Igor could comment on this. It's somewhere in between, uh, you know, individuals could opt out, but um, when they when they use particular platforms, they give up some, some of that personal um, data protection. But that still skews towards our Western liberal values, where our adversaries go in a completely different direction. Basically, the state has access to uh, individual data. And... Um, in a, uh, in a number of places, frankly, pure corruption is is a major factor. In, in Russia, you could just you could buy about just anything because uh, uh, corruption is endemic. And what you have is you know uh, this recent, uh, relatively recent um, video that um, Alexei Navalny put together about the corruption of President Putin, this 1.3 billion dollar palace that he built. 
all that was accessible open source and you know with with minimal uh restrictions of being able to pull all that data together and it's just a, a very different place to to start yeah and i think uh companies like apple are 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 starting at least with the transparency part so i think people for, first need to have awareness and I, and i know in, in some cases people say look you know modern uh, generations, you know, they're giving up privacy uh, in exchange for user experience and to be able to share, uh, you know, with the world their thoughts and things like that. Um, but uh, who's actually jumping to that conclusion? You know, so why are we allowing political ads? Should children really have access to social media at all, you know, below the age of 18 when it's their most formative years and it's easy for them to be affected by bullying uh, uh, and, and the like? Um, and so there's all of these questions that have to be raised. Um, and there's going to be some hard discussions, you know, between the public sphere and, and, and the private sector in, in terms of what at least that looks like in the, in the consumer space. Because I know uh, we all now agree that the lack of regulation there has just um, uh, essentially put the whole country at risk. You know, there's no, there's no way to sugarcoat in terms of what uh, ended up happening. Uh, and then on the, on the private sector, you know, what's happening with respect to this data, you know, being exchanged uh, back and forth. Now, there are some hopeful signs, right? Because you do see the industry moving towards edge-based uh, computing, where a lot of this AI, you can get the benefits of AI without exposing, you know, some of your personal details, because a lot of that then happens um, on your mobile device or, or devices at home, um, so that you have the smarts, but without the risk. No, fundamentally, yeah. I, I think that we should be, sorry, I just want uh, to, to uh, cover this point. I think fundamentally what we need to, to be looking at is um, as we conceive of new technologies and recognize their disruptive natures, we should be building in some, some means to protect the, the, uh, our citizenry. And this is not necessarily happening just yet. We may even be a little bit behind the eight ball, although Clearly, we're in the first of, of uh, nine innings with regards to development of AI, but we should be looking at a series of laws. I was thinking about uh, Isaac Asimov's uh, law of you know, the, 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 the robot not doing harm to, to men as a basic starting point. We should be looking at, at um, mitigating the most harmful elements of our technology to make sure that they don't harm our populations and our societies. And that's just something that industry is not able to do by itself. Government's not able to do by itself. But that partnership between the two is likely to be effective. And is there a model that exists already out there that you think we should be looking at? I don't I don't know if there's a model quite like it. I mean, the closest thing that I, I came to uh, comes to mind is this idea that you know we, we're in the when the nuclear age emerged, there had to be a, a public-private partnership in order to um, implement the, even the, the energy use of, of nuclear power. And uh, to me, that seems like, you know, that's the kind of partnership we should be looking at. Something that's really, uh, you, you, you can't have one without the other, that kind of close partnership uh, in order to, to mitigate the most harmful elements of AI or whatever technology emerges in front of AI, we should be thinking about it because they proliferate so quickly and they have such broad impact on society. Yeah, yeah and, and Michael Kane and, uh, yeah, so Michael Kane and, uh, is a, uh, was a chairperson of AI at uh, the Air Force. And he wrote a great tome here recently called uh, T-minus AI. And there he reminds us that at the dawn of the space race, uh, Eisenhower um, essentially passed the National Defense Education Act uh, together with our policymakers. Um, because you can't have awareness without education. And so I think, you know, you know, certainly emanating out of the, out of the National AI uh, Project Office, there needs to be uh, a permeating knowledge at all strata, including, you know, uh, you know, children, you know, higher ed and what have you, you know, throughout our ecosystem in terms of what this technology means, because we had that transition from agriculture to industrialization. We had industrialization to information age. Now we have that this transition to the intelligence age, and we're just going to get a. We need to get a lot smarter about what it is before, and then be aware of where it's already being leveraged for and against us. And then we can start, you know, plotting through. Okay, what what problems have we discovered? What solutions do we need 
both in the private and public sector vis-a-vis data sharing, vis-a-vis tamping down risk, vis-a-vis you know, circulating the responsibility to those that, uh, you know, that can head certain things off at the pass. Well, we're running out fantastic. of time. I just want to thank you, yeah, uh, Jennifer, for, and for, for this oh. panel. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you both. I think it's fantastic for us to end on that note of education and the next generation of technical innovators and policymakers. And I look forward to seeing what they create um, under the leadership of people like you. So thank you very much. Thank you.